Hey everyone, welcome to the Slice of Healthcare Dental Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Taylor. Joining me today is Misty Mattingly, the SVP and Chief Dental Officer at Sage Dental. Misty, how's it going? It's going good, Jared. It's going good. Thanks for having me today. I'm excited to have you here. Let's dive right in. First, just give people that kind of quick snapshot of how how uh, you being in this role came to be. Uh, maybe just kind of the the one minute spiel on uh, on your background leading up to your role at Sage Dental. Well, I'm 25 years in dentistry. Um, and, you know, it really, I've done every role in dentistry, uh, you know, be a hygienist, except be a dentist. I've not been a dentist. Um, but, you know, as a hygienist, as a operations manager, you know, district manager and so forth, multi-site for the last 15 years. And that really kind of led me to Sage about six years ago and then built their hygiene team. Um, they didn't really have much. And then that has grown. I've grown into the chief of hygiene here. That's a quick synopsis for you. <laughs> and I'm sure, like, what was it about this role that was really interesting? This is um, a, a role we've seen kind of uh, become a thing at more companies over the years. Let's talk about why why that is. Um, and, and I'm sure it, it, there's still some differences at every company, right, that have this role. Uh, but would love to hear, you know, kind of what does the day-to-day look like for you? Well, the day to day changes really every day. Right. So right now, you know, my focus is really planning out, you know, fourth quarter uh, hygiene month coming up. So I'm always planning out in advance of what's kind of happening in the field, planning out initiatives, learning new products, different things that we'll be utilizing that will help our patients chair side. Um, and then also responsible for our business plan and so forth. But also mainly, you know, a lot of what I do is education to help educate the clinical teams to help ensure that they're providing the best care to the patients and really building that value and ways in which they, they can get treatment, treatment acceptance and help the patients with getting the right treatment, right? And that goes from, you know, education to financing options to, you know, educating them on different products and procedures, making sure they have the best equipment in their hands. Um, and that's really kind of what my role is, just to ensure that my job is to support the field, right? And make sure that they have all the necessary tools. And then to myself, you know, even being a chief, one of the things I really pride myself on is I still get into the field with them. And I still work chair side alongside them and see patients because I want to see that what I'm putting into the field, that it works. Right. And that I have not only the buy-in of myself, but also the buy-in of my teams and make sure that they really like what they're utilizing and they believe in it so they can use it to help their patients. And one of the the big talking points I, I was especially excited to have you on to talk about was the, the role of oral care and overall health. And this was something we touched on a little bit when I, I had leadership from CareQuest um, partners on, which was it was a great topic. Let, let's talk a little bit more about that. So I would love if you could uh, elaborate on how oral health impacts a person's overall well-being. And then if you can shed some light maybe into some of the common misconceptions about the importance of oral care. Yeah, well, I always say that you can't spell overall health without oral health, and you can't. And so you have to be able to, you know, the two are very linked. For some reason, we have always separated the mouth from the body, but yet the two go hand in hand, um, you know. And so there's so much that we can actually see, you know, as far as health wise through the mouth. And I joke and always say, like, that's the easiest way for us to look inside you, right, is through your mouth. And you can see like the, the tissue is not healthy, you know, bleeding gums, that bleeding, the, the bleeding gums and that infection goes throughout the rest of the body. It's not just local here. And they say that, you know, like one five millimeter pocket, which, which is bleeding, which would be an infection, that infection is actually about the size of the palm of your hand. And so I always like to tell people, so if you had a sore the size of your hand, the palm of your hand on your face, would you be concerned? People would freak out, but yet they think that, oh, my gums are bleeding. It's not that big of a deal, but it is because that bacteria goes throughout the rest of the body. It 
enters the bloodstream. And that's where we also have, you know, the systemic links, you know, uh, oral health is uh, low birth weight for babies. Uh, the newest one that always gets the guys is erectile dysfunction is linked with gum health. So is Alzheimer's disease. So is uh, pancreatic cancer. Uh, so it, so many cancers, honestly and truly, they're all linked because it's all about inflammation and that inflammation and bleeding we see in the mouth, but it's impacting the rest of the body. You mentioned this a little bit, right? Um, in terms of some of like the consequences, right? It something that happens in the mouth can happen, can, you know, spread to the rest of the body. What, what can you elaborate on? Um, you know, what are some of the potential health consequences for individuals uh, specifically that don't receive that proper care? Cause you were just talking in general, right? Like let's talk about now, if you're not getting that proper, uh, proper oral, uh, oral health care, what ends up happening? Well, there's a great documentary out there called Say Ah, and it's made like probably 10, 15 years ago, but it takes six individuals that have oral um, healthcare issues, right? So they have bleeding gums, those type things, and it impacts them. You know, the consequences, like if you're trying to get pregnant, it's going to be harder for you to try and get pregnant and to have a healthy child if you have bleeding gums and, you know, also, if you're having any type of surgery, you know, whenever you're going in to have any type of surgery done, they always want a dental clearance, right? So they want to make sure of that because if your body is having, um, you know, inflammatory burden elsewhere, right? And then you're also having that inflammatory burden in the mouth, eventually your body, its immune system kind of tips over. And so chronic inflammation, like 50% of cardio cardiac events, right? are actually triggered by oral infection. And that's crazy, but it's so true. 50% of the, you know, heart attacks we see are because of that chronic infection that starts in the mouth. But yet so many people, we normalize it. Oh, we have bleeding gums. Oh, my gums bleed a little bit. Well, the fact that they bleed at all is a major concern. You know, one of my other things I always say, if you brushed your hair, and your scalp bled, would you be concerned? Heck yeah, we would be concerned. We'd be freaking out. But for some reason, we have disconnected the mouth with the rest of the body. And, you know, it wasn't until, in all honesty, it wasn't until I think 1998 that the U.S. Uh, Surgeon General actually said that oral health and overall health were two things that we as a society in America needed to focus in on because so many things were linked. And when you think about like dental hygiene, my career, um, really, it's really not even all over the world, right? We've only had dental hygienists in the United States since 1914. And so we don't really know, and we continue to learn every day, the links, you know, that and comorbidities linked to oral health. And, you know, the consequences of that is tremendous. Um, especially because patients will, you know, the worst part about an oral infection is it doesn't really hurt until it's too far gone. And that's the really sad part about oral. And that's why it's so oral healthcare. And that's why it's so important for you to see a, you know, dental professional on a regular basis. So we can, you know, look, be looking at those things and catch it earlier than later, because we also know that patients who have their dentition longer, you know, things like that, they're going to live longer. They have healthier and more than anything, a smile changes someone's life. I mean, Jared, I sit here and I look at you and I give you a smile. You're going to smile back at me, right? That's just part of it. There's a connection that we as humans have with a smile. So not only does it impact our, our overall health, but it also impacts our mental health as well. And I know as a society, we're really starting to talk more about that. And dentistry really has the capabilities to help with all aspects of health, right? Um, and mental health being one of the biggest ones that I think that we got to concentrate because if somebody's not confident with their smile, it really does change the, the way that they feel about themselves. It, it's and it's becoming more talked about in the space, uh, oral health impact on overall health, because I, I think it was last year, they did it at the HLTH conference in Vegas, they actually had a whole like, oral health, um, like pavilion, which yeah. at the healthcare conference, that wasn't something we've seen in the last couple of years. So it is being more talked about now. Well, let's get a little, not to be morbid, but yeah. we have like, this is the common story of healthcare. We have limited providers and high costs. So how did those contribute to poor health outcomes? 
Well, we do have a dental shortage, right? And that really goes back to, I strongly believe that we don't allow our providers also to do as much. So for instance, in Georgia, you know, um, versus working in Georgia versus working in Oregon, providers are allowed to do much more. So if we can also kind of get rid of the red tape and allow providers to do more, one of those things would be like teledentistry, right? So in the state that I'm in, teledentistry is not you're not allowed to do it. But think about if I were able to be able to speak with you, Jared, about your oral health care like this, right? We're communicating, we're having a conversation. Um, you know, you could take pictures of your teeth and th things like that and send it in. And there's some capabilities out there that's already out there that other states are utilizing to help populations that are in, you know, um, what they call dental deserts. So I think here in Georgia, um, where I'm at, there's 116 counties that have a dental shortage. So it's a real issue that we're having to look at. And I think, you know, um, other states like, for instance, Florida, they allow foreign trained doctors um, to come in and get a license and they can do dental hygiene. Um, you know, there's other states that really don't have a way. So we've got to look at different barriers for people to get the education. Uh, COVID really impacted hygiene um, in particular. Uh, Eight percent of uh, our dental hygienists left the field um, during COVID because it was one of it was constantly out there like this is the worst job to have because of COVID. So a lot of people did it. We've seen um, less providers going to school now, right? Less uh, students entering school for dental and for hygiene. So it's something that we have to do. Plus, it's really expensive for them to go to school with loans and stuff like that. And so there's a lot of hindrance in that as well. So we have to look at, you know, what can we do to help, you know, get people to go into school? What can we do as far as teledentistry and help out and utilize technology? And then the third layer of that would also be um, that we need to open up access to allow these providers, you know, like for instance, a people, some people don't want to come and work in my state because they can't do like, you know, we just got local. I just worked in past lasers here in Georgia, but before, you know, a year ago, you know, 48 states allowed hygienists to do local anesthesia, except for Georgia and Texas, Georgia and Texas caught up this past year. Delaware is the last state, but why would you want to come into a state if you can't, do the same type of procedures. It hinders people from coming in. And I think that, you know, we, we're currently working on a compact where providers can move. So I think that will help. But I think more than anything, we've got to open up, utilize technology to be able to help, and then also work on educating um, dental assistants, looking at foreign trained doctors maybe coming in. Thanks because as our population grows, right? We've got to be able to take care of people. And so we've got to start, legislators need to start look, thinking about things differently than we ever have, because we've always been like, oh, this is like my practice, you know, this is my basket, stay out of it. And we've got to start looking at it and then also working with other providers, not just in dentistry, but right, like start talking to the cardiologist, start talking um, and really starting working together and educating the patients that it's overall health, not oral health and the body is separate because that's how we treat it today in America. And, you know, I've been lucky and did some projects overseas and in Europe and in Europe, they do very much uh, they do a much better job of correlating the two and also mental health. They're really working and putting it all together. And, um, you know, even so much so they're utilizing dental hygienists in hospitals too now and doing an oral assessment when people come in to help them get to the right. Because like I said, mental health, overall health is impacted by oral health. And we have so much work to do here in the U.S. to help with that. Let's stay on that part for for a little bit, uh, to Misty. So uh, that was going to be my next question: was uh, how do social detriments of health, like income and education, affect oral health? And I know you hit on uh, that a little bit. Um, would love to hear any additional thoughts you had because I did want to. I wanted to make sure I asked you that on the show today. Yeah, well, I think that yeah, there definitely is. So I, honestly, Jared, I grew up in a single mom home, and then also grew up in. Um, part of from 11 to 15, I was also in foster care. 
So I wasn't that population and that's why it's so important for me to be able to offer affordable, you know, dentistry. And that's one of the things that I'm proud that we do here at Sage is we do offer affordable dentistry, um, you know, but also I think that, you know, by utilizing technology, I think we can make it more affordable to people too, right? And also utilizing preventative services earlier versus later, right? Like fluoride treatment, things like that, that we can do, um, you know, and being able to make it a part of, I mean, you'll see states now, like we're just, we're, we're going into Tennessee and even Tennessee, their Medicare um, and Medicaid plans are really starting to cover dental, which is nice to see. But I think that also so many people don't even realize that they may even have coverage. And so they're not even taking those benefits to heart as well. Sometimes I've seen that they don't realize that, you know, especially like um, mothers that are pregnant, Medicaid will pay for a mother to get scaling and root planing if that's something that they need, because they know that it's going to help the birth of that baby, right? And help that baby, you know, while it's in the womb. And so, you know, we just have to educate the public on what is out there and what benefits they have as well, but then also be open to utilizing technology to help us and caring for them. And then I think there's lots of things like, you know, um, this morning I passed a um, community health center, right? And I think that, you know, Currently, today, at a community health center, they just kind of take your blood pressure, they do the basics, but we should start implementing, you know, an oral evaluation, having somebody look in the mouth of the mirror and educating all providers, right? Not just dental hygienists, but also nurses and so forth. And we are seeing that on the pediatric side. So, for instance, in, in a pediatric practice today, um, my children's pedi pediatrician's office, they do fluoride treatment. Um, and you're now starting to see that be offered on the medical side, too, and not just on the dental side, because we know that the um, number one reason that a child misses school in the state of Georgia is actually for tooth decay, right, for a cavity. And it's 100 percent preventable if we ensure that they're getting, you know, have a good toothbrush, they're brushing their teeth daily, they're getting fluoride, you know, they're not just drinking sugary sodas all the time, right? That they're, you know, using water, they're not drinking a bottle at bedtime. So it also like, it's about educating the public as well on good oral um, health remedies and ways to care for themselves. And also making sure that doctors and dentist, hygienist, that we're all working together to be able to ensure the best overall health for our patients. And it really does take both. And there's so much that needs to be done as far as educating the public on the fact that oral health care, the oral health is so important because they just kind of, for so long, it's we just disconnect it. And, and it's super sad to see because so many people don't correlate the two together. They just kind of think, oh, it's just, I just need to brush my teeth. And that is a great way to start brushing them twice a day for two minutes, right? But also periodically you need to go in and get checked out. And so that way we can make sure that we're preventing disease before it starts because so much of what we do, we can prevent it from occurring. You just have to come see us. <laughs> I love it. Misty, I wanna thank you so much for joining us here today and um, shedding some light on some great topics. Look forward to hopefully some some future conversations uh, between us, but uh, thank you so much for joining us here today. Yeah, absolutely, Jared. I loved it. Thank you so much. And thank you for speaking about oral health care and getting this out there because we have so much to do to educate our communities. And so I thank you for doing your part.